Patrick Kennedy saves the world. I'm Kennedy, and I can't save the world single-handedly. So I have to rely on the brilliance of other people who are truly putting their necks out in the name of liberty. And one such person happens to be running for president. And when I tell my daughters that I'm going to vote for a woman for president, I'm talking about Joe Jorgensen. She's running on the libertarian ticket. She is their presidential nominee. Joe Jorgensen, welcome to Kennedy Saves the World. Oh, so glad to be here. Thanks. So, Joe, uh, walk me through your personal journey of liberty. First of all, how did you become the nominee? Because a lot of people within the liberty movement were uh, squawking and talking for months about how uh, popular Michigan congressman, who is now a libertarian, Justin Amash, he was going to uh, no longer be a Republican. He was going to seek the libertarian nomination. He did for a little bit, but you actually actually got the nom. So what happened? Well, I worked hard for it. And I think I was the perfect blend of both pragmatic and radical, what they call uh, radical ideas in that the radical caucus gave me a very high rating. And then the pragmatic caucus endorsed me. So and, and really, this is what libertarianism is all about. It really frustrates me when I hear people say that the ideas are extreme. I mean, to me, extreme ideas are having over half of our money taken by government and spent for us to have troops in 150 different countries around the world. Our ideas fit with the American uh, constitution, with the American government and the American people that we're here. We know best what's best for us. We know better how to spend our money than any politician and bureaucrat in Washington. And so I just put forth an idea that, hey, we need to sell our ideas unapologetically, but we need to do it in a way that the average voter out there gets it, that they understand how we can help them. But they don't. And that's a big problem. And this is one of the issues that I have with the Libertarian Party is, you know, it's it's not for lack of smart and passionate candidates. Uh, and I understand that the entire duopoly is set up against any party who seeks to unseat Republicans or Democrats. You know, you can have great people with great ideas, but the problem is breaking through. And now with social media and a a very different set of opinions swirling around 2020 versus 2016, 2016, they thought, was the time for uh, the liberty movement to really firm up and and take shape. But unfortunately, uh, Gary Johnson and and Bill Weld, they couldn't really do it because Bill Weld essentially endorsed Hillary Clinton at the last minute and And that was a bad look, not only for him, but also for the Libertarian Party. So why haven't you broken through? Well, I think this time it's because they're not even getting my name out there. As you know, you need to reach 15 percent in the polls in order to get on the debate stage. So 2016, they put Gary Johnson's name out there early and they put him in several polls. Well, every time your name is in a poll, then it's reported, of course, TV, radio, Internet, newspapers. And then people say, oh, wow, look, it's. Uh, Trump and Hillary Clinton. And who's this third person? You know, and then they go check out the third person because so many people don't even realize there's another alternative. So Gary Johnson got up to 13.6 percent in the polls. And I think the establishment got a little worried saying, you know, that's dangerously close to 15 percent. So what did they do this year? They didn't even put my name in the polls. So without my name in the polls and without people seeing there's a third option, it's hard to break through that. So who do you blame for that? Do you blame Republicans or Democrats? Because Democrats are worried, you know, they see Gary Johnson. They thought he was going to take votes away from President Trump. It it turns out he took votes away from Hillary Clinton. They look at Ralph Nader and Winona LaDuke in the year 2000, and they feel like he cost... Al Gore the election. So I I think Democrats are more weary of third or multi-party candidates than Republicans. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, when she was asked pointedly about superdelegates, she said superdelegates exist to keep people from Bernie Sanders from becoming our party's nominee. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, well, I think it's both Democrats and Republicans equally that don't want my voice out there because they they know that I'm the only real alternative. I'm the only one giving a completely different message because uh, with the two on the, the stage, you know, we keep hearing two old rich white guys. Well, that's the least of the problems. The real problem is both of them want to spend our money, both want to make our decisions. Neither one is going to bring the troops home and neither one has an answer to health care costs. So, of you know, you use the word duopoly. Uh, again, they know that they have the power and they don't want to let anybody else in because they could have invited me. And in. even if I weren't at 15 uh, percent, Trump or Biden could have said, yeah, you know, let's let's have, you know, she's on the ballot in all 50 states as well. Let's get her on there, too. OK, so how how would you have changed the the tenor of the debate if you had Joe Biden and Donald Trump next to you in that first debate where they were just going at each other they were interrupting each other they were insulting each other uh, would you have just sat back how how would you have as a senior lecturer uh, how would you have changed that debate well I would have actually answered the questions. And that's what Americans are desperate for. They want answers to the questions. They want to know where we stand on the issues. But I can tell you when I ran for U.S. House, the local NBC affiliate, and by the way, the media in my town actually treats us very well. I was included on the debate in 1992 with Liz Patterson and Bob Inglis. And luck of the draw, I got to be in the middle of the stage. And the next day, the Greenville News published an article in which they referred to me as a rose between two thorns. Because again, they were bickering back and forth and I was the one answering the questions. And a lot of, a lot of the reaction was, wow, you know, I guess she's not a real politician because she actually answers questions and and I kind of like her answers. All right. So let's talk about a libertarian solution to COVID-19. What would a Jorgensen presidency, given all the information and given the, the federal bureaucracy that every president inherits, what would a Joe Jorgensen administration have done differently? The biggest thing is I would have gotten rid of the obstacles in the FDA that prevented people from being testing tested. And by the way, I would have already gotten rid of those obstacles. So we would have been ready to go. But uh, had this been the first year of my administration, I would have gotten I would have put it at the top of the list because South Korea confirmed their first case within about a day of our first case. And they quickly jumped ahead in testing, containing the spread and and they were able to get ahead of the curve without any shutdowns. Meanwhile, we're all under house arrest and we lose tens of millions of jobs because we didn't know who could go out and safely work and who needed to stay home. And to add insult to injury, Trump stood on stage with Dr. Fauci and said, if you don't have symptoms, you don't need to get tested. And yet they knew at the time that over half the people with the virus didn't have any symptoms at all. I mean, that's the time. But they but they get- didn't they didn't have tests because, uh, like you said, the right. bureaucracy dictated that in a crisis that it was only certain universities and federal facilities that were able to manufacture and administer tests, which, you know, is is an impossible task when you're talking about the need to test tens of millions of people. And uh, when I got sick in mid-March, they were trying to talk me out of getting a test. And unless you had just come back from, uh, you know, a a coughing cave in, in Wuhan, China, they were not eager to administer tests to people. So it was it was really difficult. And a lot of the early tests were uh, were flawed. So obviously, well, Democrats are one of one of the biggest claims that Democrats are making is that uh, President Trump knew too much too soon and did too little. So does that mean that there is too much power concentrated in the executive branch if the president can single handedly withhold information all by himself uh, to the point where hundreds of thousands of people die? Well, of course, there's too much power. And I would say there's too much power even without uh, the COVID response. But let me quickly add to about the testing. There were literally dozens of testing kits that were being sold around the world. And between the FDA and CDC, 
we were originally only being able to use two of them. And President Trump could have done some kind of emergency powers act and said, "Okay, we need to get this done today. And he could have done something. There were there were in fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but even a few weeks ago, there are still tests that can be used around the world. And sure, at first they weren't all perfect, but they were better than nothing. I mean, they were good enough for Singapore. I mean, uh, South Korea to get ahead. And K-pop. I think that's all we have to say about that. Uh, one of my biggest worries about the uh, the multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages that are either being implemented or talked about is that is so much money. There is so little oversight and it invites so much corruption. Uh, would you endorse Congress passing multi-trillion dollar spending packages in order to lift the economy? If not, what would your solution Solution be or what would it have been? Yeah, absolutely not. And here's the thing, even if there weren't corruption, we still shouldn't do it because the research is clear that money left in the hands of businesses create twice as many jobs as money in the hands of government. And I've even heard people say, well, what about the wealth inequality? Well, you know, would you rather leave the money in the hands of businesses, even large ones like General Motors or um, Apple, and allow them to uh, come up with new jobs? Or do you want to give your money to Donald Trump and Joe Biden and let them create the new jobs. I mean, obviously, the businesses out there can create much better jobs. And the other problem with the CARES Act is that the money already went to the people who were allowed to stay open during the crisis. And we had mom and pop stores who were forced to be closed. And how about let us keep the money and then we can spend the money where we want. And I know I would have spent it at the local mom and pop store rather than the big corporations. And there are so many businesses, especially, you know, you walk around. I live in Manhattan and you walk around and your favorite bars and your favorite restaurants are not only closed, they're closed for good. And yep. and I don't know what the long term impact is going to be. So that's covered. But what do you see uh, the biggest crisis facing this country right now? And it could be it could be anything. It could be a foreign policy yep. threat. It could be another pandemic. It could be the issues we have in terms of of race. It could be deficit spending. But but what is the most critical thing you see right now? I think it's health care, because first of all, it is literally a life or death situation. And secondly, there's so much misinformation out there. If there's one idea I could get to every American voter out there is that we do not have a free market system. We keep hearing these politicians say, well, free market didn't work. You know, guess we'll have to go to single payer. Well, when I when they when they say we need Medicare for all, what I think is be a hospital for all and top down monopolies never work. They're nope. not working for Great Britain. They're not working for Canada. Why do we want a failed system? And uh, if and, and, you know, when people ask me why I'm running for office, I tell them because government is too big, too bossy, too nosy, too intrusive. But the worst part is they often hurt the very people they're trying to help. And if you look at health care, uh, we are the only industrialized country with our health care tied to employment. And you say, well, that's odd. Why is that? Well, it's because of the government, because of what they did in World War II. So they they try to fix one problem and they create 10 more. And right now, um, the answer to our current big government failure isn't an even bigger government failure. We've got to get government out and we need to fashion ourselves after a system that does work. OK, so and this is this is what I would say, because I talk to people about this a lot. And my friends who trend left, uh, you know, their their biggest concern is helping people who really need it and, and creating a safety net. Uh, but I tend to agree with you that we haven't even implemented a free market system. And I, I think there's there's much less downside in a totally free market system, even if it's an experiment, even if we did a five year experiment in terms of innovation and choice, uh, people would be healthier, they would live longer and they would live better lives if they were subjected to uh, drugs, treatments, immunotherapies 
and various technology that could uh, alleviate suffering and lengthen and improve their lives. And the free market does the best job of doing that. I, I tell people that all the time because if you have a free market system, let's say let's say we do it for five years and let's say it's an abysmal failure. We can't figure it out. There are too many moving parts. And, you know, that that's fine. I, I will let you have that assumption. But if you have a, a top down nationalized, socialized healthcare system like Medicare for all that, you know, that is a massive safety net. The when that thing implodes, it takes the entire economy down with it. So what are some things and, and I want some specifics here because we talk sure. about the free market and we can always be very vague as libertarians when we talk about that. But specifically, when, when you talk about the free market, what are you talking Talking about and explain what what each of those things are. Well, the biggest problem we have right now is that our insurance system isn't really insurance. Our health insurance system, in any other industry, uh, insurance only covers unexpected costs. So, look, let's say, um, let's look at car insurance. What if it paid for gas, oil? and car washes. You would have absolutely no reason to shop around for the cheapest gas price. In fact, you might even go to the nicest gas station where they give you free coffee because what do you care? You pay your little $5 copay. It costs just as much to go to the expensive one as the cheap one. Therefore, the gas stations have no reason to compete against each other. In fact, they could raise their prices without you even knowing it because they're passing their prices along to the car insurance companies. And then the car insurance companies would simply raise your premiums the following year and then you would get that same spiral that we see in healthcare. And we can look at, uh, well, well, first of all, uh, let's get specifics. If we look at um, the one of the free, one of the two somewhat free market healthcare fields in our country, it would be LASIK eye surgery. And if you look over a 20 year period from like the early 90s to 2012, the, the costs went down 70% while all other health care went up 125%. So I would ask your liberal friends, how is it helping to have a system in which prices are going up 125% when you can have doctors and and uh, health care facilities and clinics all competing for you. And, you know, I keep hearing these ridiculous uh, laws that they're proposing. Like, well, we need to put prices. You know, everybody needs to see prices. Well, we don't hear them trying to pass laws to have prices in grocery stores or when you go to buy a car or a computer because you care about what you're, you're spending. And one last quick thing. They have a system in Singapore that's working great. And they're healthcare costs are about a third what ours are. Uh, and to give you an example, um, well, well, like one of the better ones, where whereas it costs about $130,000 for a heart bypass here, it costs $18,000 for a heart bypass there because they're competing just like people compete when they sell cars. And doctor visits are only $10 there. So why not go to a system like that? And, and I want to know why the politicians are going, uh, are suggesting something that's failed everywhere. And last, Democrats and liberals hate corporate monopolies. So why would you ever want to have a a government monopoly? How is that going to be any better? We have more of this interview in moments coming up. All right. One of the things that uh, that happened because of Obamacare, and this is really interesting, is all of a sudden all of these new uh, rehab centers started popping up because Obamacare uh, yeah. covered rehab, you know, which sounds great because we want to tackle addiction and have rehabilitation replace incarceration. That's fine. Those are those are good intentions. A lot of times good intentions go bad, but then it became a, a, a fraudulent system where there were companies that were convincing people to sign up for Obamacare and send them to rehab because they were getting something on the back end. So again, you have these these well-intentioned government systems that are magnets for corruption. And the more money you pour into them, the more corruption you have. But I, I want to talk about, because that sort of transitions into legalizing. Oh, well, you, oh go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Do you mind if I had one quick thing? Please, go ahead. 
Yeah, um, for instance, a doctor in Massachusetts told me that you cannot sell an insurance policy in Massachusetts unless it covers fertility treatments. So if you're 70 years old, you have to pay for fertility treatments uh, in, in your insurance. When I was running for VP in Michigan, all insurance policies had to offer hair plugs and as part of the policy. So I don't even think that this is good intent. This is nothing more than capital cronyism or, you know, cronyism where they're just uh, accepting bribes from all their friends in high places and then making people buy something they don't need and they don't want and they can't afford. Yeah, I also think that the people who aren't sending kids to school probably shouldn't be paying uh, that part of their taxes for education. You know, call me a a bluff old traditionalist, but I do think we should have some choice in terms of where our money goes. But I've, I've always thought that the war on drugs has been so fruitless and tragic. And one of the biggest criticisms leveled at libertarians is when it comes to legalizing drugs, you're all libertines. So what drugs do you think should be legal in this country? Well, I guess my quick answer is it depends on how much crime you want to get rid of. Uh, if you want to get rid of a lot of crime, then we need to decriminalize all of them because the problems we have right now are prohibition problems, not drug problems. And I often ask people who are concerned about this, and, and by the way, real quick, a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't use illegal drugs, so this really doesn't affect me. Well, it does affect you because it affects your kids at school, it affects the safety in your streets. So I ask people, when's the last time you heard of a liquor store owner going up and down the halls of a high school uh, trying to push gin? Or when's the last time you heard of a vodka vodka ha- uh, addict breaking into houses in order to support their alcohol habit? Or when's the last time you heard of two liquor store owners having a shootout over the best corner? Those are all prohibition problems. The same problems we had in the 1920s with Al Capone in Chicago. We're having the same shootouts in Chicago again, and innocent people are being killed. Yes. And and prisons are filling up still, even though both conversations or both parties are having conversations nominally uh, about criminal justice reform. They're really not talking about taking the next big step, which is, you know, decriminalizing, as you say, or legalizing drugs, because that is essentially what you have to do. When you you look at the tragedy of people who overdose on fentanyl, uh, those are lives that could have been saved if a majority of those people knew what they were putting into their body. And if something is illegal, uh, it oddly enough, those substances don't come with a list of ingredients. So you really don't know what you're putting into your body. And it just goes to show that both parties have an implicit distrust of and, citizens. And, and they think that, that people are bad at making their own decisions. And, you know, Sheikha Dalmi at Reason said that uh, people are much better at making their own bad decisions. <laughs> or the way I like to say it is there shouldn't be a law against being stupid. But even further, we wouldn't have the opioid crisis we have now if marijuana had been legal so people could have used marijuana for their pain instead of going straight to the top. And also Milton Friedman pointed out that we would never have had crack cocaine invented had cocaine not been illegal because it wouldn't have made economic sense. Just like in Prohibition, uh, beer drinking and wine drinking went down down and liquor sales went up because it was more concentrated so you could smuggle it easier. Same thing is happening with drugs. Yes. Absolutely. And and that's why, you know, in places like California, what they sell in dispensaries is is very different than what was sold on street corners, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your BLM tweet, because that really upset a lot of libertarians. Do you have any regret about supporting BLM uh, when there are libertarians who feel like even though, again, you may have had good intentions, but uh, the organization itself is sort of shrouded in groupthink. Well, first of all, that was a typo. It wasn't supposed to be capitalized as in the organization. But yes, I did meet with a Black Lives Matter leader who was not associated with the uh, Marxist group. But you know what? Here's the thing. They, the, they are marching because they want to end qualified immunity. 
they're marching because they want to end no-knock raids. They realize that the war on drugs is racist and destructive and destroying their lives. So we see the same problems that they see. They just look towards government as the answer, and we're looking at government as a problem. But I say we need to explain our message to everybody. And by the way, when I did meet with that leader, I asked him, I said, did you realize that the bus that Rosa Parks sat on when she was asked to sit on the back of the bus, did you realize that that was a government run, government owned bus? And he said, no, I didn't. And I said, imagine if Uber discriminated against the 60 percent of their best customers, since at the time, you know, 60 percent of the bus ridership was black. They bought a business. And and in talking with me, he's like, you know, th- th- these are some really good ideas. And, and I could tell he was really thinking because he was asking me a lot of questions. And also he was um, he was a black preacher who had been a. Uh, in, in prison. And so, of course, he couldn't own a gun. And I said, well, libertarians believe that you have the right to defend yourself. And if you've done your prison time, then now that you're on the outside, you have the right to defend yourself. If you're so dangerous that you can't be trusted with a gun, then you should still be in prison. And so he really liked a lot of the ideas he was hearing. And so how about we talk to the people who see, you know, they already agree with us on the problem. How about let's show them what the real solution is. And, you know, my heart breaks for them because the the reason they're there is because of big government. And it just breaks my heart that they're going to the very people who put them in that position to begin with. Well, I, I know that uh, that you have had a tough time throughout this campaign. Uh, not only were you viciously attacked by a bat, which <laughs> might have been one of my family members. My mom was born in Transylvania, Romania. That is a true story. Uh, wow, but cool. also, uh, I want to extend my condolences on the passing of your own mother. Uh, I lost my dad five years ago, and I think about him every day. And it made me realize that uh, that grief is a journey and it's it's really really tough and it's it's tough to reconcile in the short term and in the long term uh, how is it affecting not only your campaigning but also how you see the world well first of all my mother you know she hasn't been in good health for probably the last year and i did spend a lot of time with her as much time as i could it, and, you know, she lived in a different state. Uh, luckily, she was near where we had our national convention, so I could visit her during then. But she kept telling me, no, don't change your schedule for me. She was just so happy. And she was just so proud that I was on my, you know, that I had a bus. And she had to tell all her friends about the bus. So, um, you know, it, it does make you appreciate life more because you're just reminded that, yeah, you're not here forever to uh to either be the best person you want to be or to make the changes in the world that you want to see. You know, we, we've all got deadlines. So what are you going to do from this point on? And how is this experience? How will it affect you as a lecturer? How will it affect you as you talk to young people uh, in this socialistic university system? And, and how do you convince them to think for themselves? And how has running for president changed that? Well, first of all, I'm grateful that I'm at a fairly conservative university. Um, It would be very difficult to teach in some of these places that I hear about. But uh, keep in mind, I was the uh, VP nominee in 1996. With with the great Harry Brown. Yes, yes. Uh, Ten years before I started teaching. In fact, a a few, and and I never talk politics, you know, unlike the liberals who think that they should use tuition, you know, their students' tuition money to espouse their own views. I don't bring up my own views, although I do try to give more libertarian examples. But uh, every now and then I'd have a student say, you know, I googled your name to find out where your office was and a Wikipedia page came up. <laughs> Is that really you? So, um, so yeah, I, I already had that experience before. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see where you go from here. I really wish that you had gotten more traction. I wish that the Commission on Presidential Debates uh, would be more open minded, even for Howie Hawkins. Like I would have loved to have seen the four of you on stage having an honest intellectual debate, because my worry is from this point forward, no one is going to hold these candidates accountable and hold their feet to the fire on spending, which I still think is the most critical issue and everything else 
follows from that. So if there's one thing, if there's one way Joe Jorgensen can save the world, how is that? Taking the power out of the hands of the bureaucrats and giving it back to the people. And power includes money, too. But you might be um, happy to hear that about 75 percent of our volunteers from the beginning of the campaign are from outside the party. So we are attracting a lot of people who are saying the old system just isn't working. It's broken. Someone's got to fix it. Joe Jorgensen, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, so glad to be here. And I'm at Joe20.com, by the way. (laughs) Joe20.com. This has been Kennedy Saves the World. I'm Kennedy. For more podcasts from my friends at Fox, you can go to foxnewspodcast.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Oh, go ahead and leave me a review while you're there. I'd love to hear what you have to say. You've been listening to Kennedy Saves the World on the Fox News Podcast Network. 